Hello everybody and welcome to this mold drainage and soil loosening masterclass. We're really pleased to bring this together for you and to be joined by Philip Wright from Wright Resolutions today. He'll be known to many of you as an independent soils and cultivation advisor and a specialist in his area. Today is all about going into some of the detail around mould drainage and soil loosening and to give you some of the best practice and examples um, to use on farm. So this has come about and um, we had many requests over um, you know, lengths of time about mould drainage, about the practice of it, how to, to do it um, in the right way um, for you on farm, the conditions of where to do it. And, this webinar um, was pulled together as part of Strategic Farm Week and we've had a lot of requests to, to do the recording, um, so bring it um, together here for you today. There's some examples of, of good practice and maybe um, different practice here um, on the screen. And just to say there's a couple of videos, so David Lord has done a, a little two minute summary um, on HDB Serials and OSC's YouTube as well um, to put this into practice with a bit of a live uh, demonstration there as well. So the content um, for this session is I'm going to hand over to Philip and Philip's going to take us through the technical details on mould drainage. We'll then have some questions um, and a bit of a discussion between Philip and I after that. And then we've got a second section on soil loosening. So we're going to talk about a bit of the, the ideas and the principles behind soil loosening and how the two fit together. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Teresa Meadows and I work for HGB as a Knowledge Exchange Manager in the Cereals North Seas team covering East Anglia. And I'm going to be hosting um, this session with you. Um, but the questions very much come from questions that farmers um, and the industry have asked based on this um, previously. So I think without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Philip and we'll start on the mould drainage section. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much, Teresa. And uh, yeah, the plan really for the next uh, half an hour or so, a little bit more, is, is for me to give you a, a few ideas on um, the principles behind mould drainage uh, and how that integrates with land drainage on the farm, which uh, I'm sure everyone would be in agreement really is a key a key plank to um, sustainable and, and effective farming you've got to have good drainage those of you that are, are blessed with good drainage um, as, a, as a natural part of your soil structure that's that's excellent for those that uh, uh, need to have um, a, a reasonably uh, effective infrastructure built in then this is really applying to to, to those of you that uh, to, that need that so if we consider drainage as a whole just really starting with um, where the actual water uh, leaves the farm uh, and, and work backwards there from from the actual outfalls to, to the field drains to what well, to the ditches and then the field drains and then through the profile to the soil surface really we through all of that path we need we need a clear passageway for water excess water to get through that profile easily and quickly and effectively when we've got soils that are above field capacity and mould drainage does really form part of that chain uh, for certain soils and, and, and that's really the part of today is really to, to discuss where it's applicable and how to make it most effective. Um, so if, if, if we go back from a, a ditch or making sure that we've got the ditches cleared, we've got outfalls clear, we've got free passageway into those areas, then we're looking at the the main drains themselves. Discuss briefly a few, a few features of those, and if we move upwards a notch from there to the actual, potentially that's where a mould drain would fit in to to actually join the the main lattice work of of, of drains, um, to the soil surface, and if necessary, then to create a clear pathway through down to the moles and through down to those main drains by a soil loosening process if that's necessary and that's a classical if you like the the, the traditional classical um, system for ensuring we've got drainage through the entire uh, profile right the way through the farm and, and the final part of the uh, discussion today I'll be looking at um, methods of soil structuring near the surface um, Clearly, these days we're, 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 we're thinking that um, we can we can use all of nature, and, and with that I mean a lot of a lot of the features of, of plant roots growing through the soil to create 
effective structure and resilient structure and, and it may well be and we'll finish up by thinking about this you know do we need uh, both a combination of metal and roots or can we get away with roots to do that surface action uh, and th th there is no right and wrong answer to this so we'll, we'll explore a few of those possibilities as we go through so I think <clears throat> initially then identify really where if you've got a problem with drainage what what is likely to be the cause identify where that area might be and and if we start by thinking about the groundwater as you'd call it that's the the infrastructure that actually gets the, the the water away from the field to the ditch and off the farm and in that groundwater have we got barriers to to, to water movement potentially that could be the the issue or we, we we might be nearer to the surface and, and we might be looking at some surface water being held up by either uh, a barrier to water movement with a with a cultivation pan or um, a pan of some description um, or even just a very simple interface between topsoil and subsoil that can also be a, a factor there so number one identify where the key problem is then if we if, if we move that on to thinking about some fundamentals of, of, of mole ploughing, um, it's, a, it's a relatively old picture this. I, I don't apologise for it. You know, the, the principles of, of mole draining really haven't changed. Um, some of the technology clearly has, but the, the actual principle of employing a, um, a cylindrical cartridge or bullet uh, together with an expander behind linked to a tine on a long on a long beam is 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 really the principle here and we're, what we're looking to do is pull a channel through the soil through the subsoil uh, at a depth well above the main drains but preferably into the area of backfill above those main drains if you have actually got backfill and we'll talk about backfill in due course because it's a it is quite an important part of this so we're going to create a, a, a lattice work, if you like, of secondary channels above the main drains so that we're intercepting water and, and we're, we're, we're encouraging water down through and into those main drains more, as effectively and efficiently as we can. So as part of the first sort of principles, I'd like to look at the mechanics of how we form a stable channel in the soil by this method, how we can keep it on grade, for example. Clearly, there's a uh, a need to, to have um, a fairly stable channel here and, and certainly a fairly even grade so we're not we haven't got um, bends in the bottom of these channels that's going to hold water up for example we need to keep and maintain the grade and the importance of backfill which is really that that pathway between a mole and the main drain but it's also a very useful interceptor for any flow of water at subsurface levels through the soil so we'll put a more modern picture in there just to to highlight a single beam mole drainer of um, a slightly more recent uh, time of build. Um, and let's think initially about how we form that channel in the soil. So if, if you consider that, that bullet and expander uh, as part of that tine, um, that bottom end is, is deliberately designed to have a cylindrical bullet, which is quite long. Uh, we're, we're, we're towing this through the soil and the whole principle of this bullet is that it will actually be, be quite stable and form quite a stable even grade of channel um, and, and the reason for that is is all due to the restoring forces that are present on that on that bullet um, well, and, and we've got more or less a balance between upward and downward sliding frictional forces on that bullet when we're looking at it in this in this angle direction if if you consider that this is on that on that main beam that's pivoting about the drawbar pin or about the, 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 the point of attachment of the, of the beam. If, for example, that, that bullet starts to want to ride out, it wants to reduce its depth, then that natural pivoting action creates a, a, a pitch on that bullet with a, a huge restoring force generated that push, wants to push that back down level again. You can see that from that, that, that graphic there. If, on the other hand, the bullet wants to go deeper then we, we generate a big restoring force again to push it back up level again so we have in essence here a very stable action that's going on through the soil it does rely on this on the soil you're pulling it through being consistent 
because if that is inconsistent then we're going to get inconsistencies building in here but again what well, i'll talk about consistency of of, of sort of texture and, and sort of structure in a moment going forward that to uh, that backfill that gravel above the, the the actual main drain channel clearly every time that uh, that that mole channel is 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 passing through the the, the backfill there's there's the ability for that water to come out of that that mole channel and go straight into the into the land drain provided you've got a good connection there so every main drains um length within this every, every time you've got a main drain in the field uh, providing you're pulling these moles somewhat obliquely right angles or more or less quite quite near to a right angle or oblique to those uh, backfill channels then we're, we're going to create a situation where water can exit from that mole in either direction e either end of it and and if your main drains are 20 or 30 or so meters apart let's say then we haven't actually got a long distance where we have to maintain a very consistent grade if we've got backfill in the field um, if we haven't got backfill in the field and we're just pulling a channel as a, as a bare channel then if we've got undulating soil conditions or a, a, a field that's got varying grade on it and we haven't got those backfill channels then there is a much greater risk for that water to to start to lie in the low spots in those moles and ultimately what you can get very often then is is, is the mole mold channels actually feeding to low spots in the field and making low spots wet low spots and and, and wet spots wetter and, and the higher dry spots slightly drier so you can actually exacerbate a problem with with fields that have got undulations in them if you haven't got backfill drains and that's something to to be very aware of you've got to be very careful how you pull those molds then preferably from the ditch upwards on a slight grade so that you can actually achieve that degree of fall and 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 be able to lose that water down those channels so the the, the other action that backfill will 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 give you is is where we've got what we call subsurface flow and and, and often the transition between the topsoil and the subsoil where you go from um, very much more structured, very probably very much more organic type of soil, higher in organic matter content to a higher clay content subsoil. Water can naturally flow along those lines. It's a bit like moving down a, a damp proof course almost in your field. And where those where those lines are intersected again by backfill, you will get the ability for water to be taken down through to your main drain. So backfill although it's expensive and, and heavy to cart and everything else does have a very very key part to play in in, in, in efficient and effective drainage in many many soil types as i clearly hopefully you can see from those little graphics there so let's let's move on to think about the the various types of mold drainer that are, are generally in common use if we start with a little graphic there and start with the uh, the one top left hand corner the the fully mounted um, clearly a very simple machine fits on the three point linkage of a tractor often will have a, a disc coulter in front of a, of a of a single leg and a, and a bullet and expander fitted to it probably its most simplest form we'll talk a little bit about how those are set up and how they can be um, adjusted and uh, and tweaked in due course if you look at the left hand side column bottom picture and the top uh, right hand side second column picture we're now into the long beam style of mold drainers which traditionally most people would be aware of as, as a, a fairly standard stock in trade bit of kit um, they can either run with the beam scrubbing on the deck most people would probably feel that they they ought to scrub on the deck i'll talk a bit about that in due course um, you, you get a number that are built with a either a zigzag or the front end of the of the actual long beam on the deck which is effectively the depth control in that sense and and the back end of that may well have a, a clearance for the um, for the tine to avoid residues building up for example in front of the tine and then trying to push that beam up off the ground and, and, and upset your your gradient um, and, and a derivative of that uh, which Brian runs you can see on the right hand side second column uh, sorry first uh, first uh, column second row uh, uh, those two pictures there show a, a twin beam single leg mold drainer where you've got a, a again the gap 
uh, allowing for residues to build up and fall off where the leg uh, uh, is actually um, running through the ground, but the beams are either side of that. It's a similar principle uh, to the uh, the long beam scrubbing. You've just got two beams involved in that stage. And then if, if we move on to the, uh, the final version, which is probably your more purist version of a mole drainer now, a, a long beam floating version, where the, 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 the intention here is to run the beam floating clear of the deck. So we're relying on that um, long cartridge or bullet restoring action to maintain that grade very precisely. And we're not actually using the ground surface to, to control our depth. Instead of that, we're using the pivot point where we're towing that uh, machine, where we're towing that beam from, we're using that pivot point to be our means to control our depth. If you raise the pivot point up, the, 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 the beam will come clear of the ground, still running parallel with the ground, more or less. If you lower that pivot point down, you can actually get it to the, to the stage where the beam contacts the ground. But we're, we're maintaining um, the depth of the mole in that sense now by actually altering our pivot point our hitch point and and that presents us with one or two opportunities to to make a very refined mole it, it allows us to control the depth of the mole to a certain extent and and there are a, a great number of machines that are designed to run either with the beam floating or clear of the ground depending on on the preference so uh, i'll come back to the floating beam uh, design in due course with a little bit more detail clearly if you've got a, a floating beam then that's got the capability of, of, of riding over the top of undulations and, and bridging uh, as, as a scrubbing beam would, bridging over uh, depressions in the ground, um, much better than something that's scrubbing the deck. So we, we, we're less susceptible to variations in the soil uh, surface when we're looking at a floating beam application there. So let's move back to basic principles for a few moments and now consider how those lumps of iron and lumps of metal can actually be made to work. And those of you that have, have heard me or a number of my um, peers talk in the past will, will know about the concept of critical depth, very important pr uh, principle associated with pulling any form of tine through the ground, whether that's a mole or a, a loosening tine or a chisel tine or a winged loosener. Um, there is a, a depth below where the lifting action of whatever tine it is, that lifting action is less than the weight of soil above. At that point, the soil will want to move sideways or downwards, and we create a plastic flow of soil. We're actually compressing the soil against itself. It's very, it's very much a compressive and plastic action, and, and we say that, that that action is below the critical depth in the line of the red arrows there, below that critical depth. If, on the other hand, we move nearer the surface and we've got a similar lifting action. At some point, the lifting action becomes greater than the weight of soil above. And at that point, the soil will be lifted and we're above the critical depth. Clearly, when you're loosening soil, if we want to loosen soil, we need to be above our critical depth. And if we're trying to create a mole channel that's got a compressed, uh, firmed channel and it's closed the leg slot above it, we need to be below the critical depth for that to work properly. So we've got two distinct actions here uh, from the mole draining point of view. We, 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 we're very much at depth looking for that below critical depth operation. And if you look at the uh, the picture here of the, of the mole bullet entering the screen there, entering the soil as it goes away, you can see at mole depth and just above it, we've got a, a series of horizontal cracks indicative of below critical depth operation, whereas near the surface, we've got the series of fissures that have been uh, developed as a much more of a vertical crack showing it's above critical depth. So where the leg itself is, is working through the ground near the surface, we've got a above critical depth slightly loosening action, allowing uh, those, those fissures to feed water down towards that mole whereas at depth, we're creating that plastic soil flow, we're creating that plastic uh, channel itself. And, and that's the sort of classic sort of above ground action you see, those vertical cracks above critical depth there coming through to the surface and forming a, a series of herringbone type style cracks, classical uh, herringbone cracking and fissuring created by a, the passage of that, uh, that mole leg itself. 
whereas below we've got those more horizontal cracks. And, and those sort of depths we're, we're talking about now very much are dictated by the um, the actual depth of the drains in your in your field and the the, the 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 height of backfill above them. Clearly, we need to be working well above the main drain so we're not risking damaging them. But we also, in an ideal world, uh, would be wanting to pull through that backfill. So that's giving us a, a sort of target envelope of 45 to 55 centimeters working depth normally, and most common mole uh, spacings would be between two and three meters. Um, from that point of view. And it, a little point of note here with RTK guidance and, and mapping systems available on, on a lot of tractors these days, I've always feel it's a good it's good practice to actually map where you're actually pulling the moles. Um, you've maybe made reference to, to the drainage maps for a start of the field because they should have the mole directions on them and I'll, we'll talk a bit about mole. Uh, drainage map or drainage maps before we finish um, but if you actually map where you've pulled those moles um, it, it's likely if you if you've made the mole in good conditions it, it's going to have a life of more than five six or so years in many cases you can you can often dig you can often dig down and find moles that have been there for 10 or more years so if if the policy is to to repeat moulding on fields to ensure you've got a consistency of, of drains every five or six years let's say if the next time you you, you come back to where you've mapped your moles and, and and do the next series between those that you've done last time uh, dead, dead center between them you, you, you do potentially give yourself a chance to to exploit this more and, and exploit any of those older moles for longer whereas if you're pulling uh, the moles at sort of random uh, nature if you're pulling them in the same direction in the same place then you, you're naturally going to destroy those 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 previously four moles as long as we're moving through backfill i would suggest that's probably the most efficient way is to, is to use mapping to help you along the line there a few uh, a few other little minor points but very important uh, in order to get the most effective uh, uh, mole drain that you can in an ideal world, we need uh, a subsoil to have more than 30% clay content to be long to, to be long lived. It certainly wants to be less than 30% sand. Not too worried about whether it's calcareous or non-calcareous in that matter, as long as it's uh, of, of those sort of levels of clay content. Um, a rule of thumb, a, a little way you can check that. If, if you grab a lump of soil from mole draining depth, I'm assuming that you've probably dug down in one or two places to check depth of backfill in the field. Um, take a lump of soil out from mole draining depth, uh, roll it into a ball, into a, about the size of a golf ball. Good, good firm palm pressure on this. Roll it into a ball, stick it into a, into a glass of water overnight. You should still be able to see that ball of, of, of clay in the morning. We shouldn't have started to see much in the way of that degrading down and that that ball starting to collapse. If it does, it's telling us we really haven't got the sort of clay content or the type of clay that's going to necessarily hold a very good mole. So that's a, a good little way of just checking that out. It's very important then to have the right moisture content to, to form that plastic um, mole itself. And, and, and plastic mole formation wants to be uh, generally as a result of the, of the soil being able to be plastically deformed easily. If you take again a, a lump of soil from mole draining depth and roll it between the palms of your hand into a narrow ribbon, as you can see the bottommost picture there. If you take that ribbon and, and, and gently roll it into a horseshoe, you should be able to do that without seeing distinct fissures or cracks on the on the middle part of the horseshoe there. If that's the case, we have got soil in an ideal plastic state suitable for mold draining. Uh, that will give you the best chance of, of achieving long lived moles in your fields. If we get that, we should be between five and 10 year life expectancy of those moles. Um, as long as we've got the right appropriate uh, soil texture. Um, having that plasticity at depth in an ideal world we would like to be drier near the surface for traction for, for better grip less wheel slip 
Um, so we're really looking at a soil condition as a whole here where we're plastic at depth and dry near the surface. So more often than not, that's a situation that occurs as the soil is in a, a drying cycle, going from fully saturated to drying. So it's going to be drier near the surface first, um, rather than a, a natural wetting cycle, which you would get more in an autumn situation, let's say, where we're actually getting a um, soil that's actually wetting up from the surface down through to depth. That's my phone going off. Shall we just hang on while it finishes? Sorry about that. I'll, do, I'll just carry on straight back once it's gone off. It won't be long, hopefully. Right. OK, so. So, yeah, generally we're looking at a, at a situation here where where we're needing the soil to be in that drying cycle. Um, drying from the top down, which is more often than not a spring situation rather than an autumn situation. So by and large, if, if you've gone through a, a, a dry summer and into a dry autumn and then we're starting to get a bit damper, not the ideal time to go mold grading, really, because we've probably got the exact reverse of what we actually want. We've got a wetter surface for poorer wheel slip and grip, and we've got a too dry a situation at depth. So technically, in the textbook, would have always told us the best time to mould drain is in a spring situation, really, uh, in, in that sense. Probably not what you want to hear, but nevertheless, that's the ideal time to do it. In terms of grade of moulds, well, as long as we've got backfill, as we've talked about, we can we can very much work on whatever the surface undulations are, whatever the surface natural grade is, as long as we, we're cutting through backfill, we're going to actually produce a, an effective mould. Um, if we haven't got backfill, we've got to be a little bit careful. In an ideal world, we need more than half a percent of, um, of, of, of grade. Um, so certainly we're looking at, uh, at, at more than one in 200 as, as, as a fall somewhere between one and two percent so somewhere between um uh one in 50 one in 100 somewhere around about there is a fall is ideal if we if we've got less than half a percent less than one in 200 it's highly likely the water is going to sit in those moles and will start to degrade them quite quickly um so that's that's not such a good situation in an ideal world thinking about that trailing beam operation now as you can see with the picture there, that this particular version's actually got clearance between the uh, the ground surface and the uh, the beam where the the time fits through, um, deliberately to try and avoid residues building up in that area and riding that mole out. Um, other ways of, of of avoiding that situation, number of ways you can you can use a a coulter or a, a disc coulter or a knife coulter to cut through either under the front of the beam or just ahead of the beam or within the beam at the front so that we actually part any root ball and any surface residues to to avoid them building up around that leg um, and, and traditionally in in, in old days um, if you were working with a with a track lane crawler for example typical operation for something like that one or two of the older operators would probably stick a long drawbar pin in and scrawk a little, a little narrow cleared area right at the back of the tractor where we, we, we're going to move residue out the way of that beam itself. So various ways of doing it in, the, in that respect. Moving, um, just referring back to that floating beam operation, if you recall, clearly if the beam's well above the deck, um, we haven't really got the risk of, of residues building up. And, and this this sort of more purist type of, of system, um, if if the actual design of that uh, carriage is done properly, you can see that the drawbar pin around about where the tractor rear wheel is, um, the actual carriage wheel somewhere rearward of the pivot point, that's actually acting as a smoothing frame now. And if either the wheel of that carriage or the wheel of the tractor rides up and down, if the if the pivot point is more or less mid, midway between those two, we're actually smoothing those undulations out. We're reducing that tendency to to to, to actually affect that mole uh, grade and height of the, of the of the pulling point of the mole itself. And and technically, this is probably the the most precise way you can you, you can manage a mole. You can see the bottom right hand picture there is 
is moulding through a sports ground um, situation where, again, we need very precise but very um, minimal amount of surface disturbance uh, from that point of view. So we don't really, in that situation, want the beam scrubbing the deck necessarily to take out that grass sward. Uh, so that that's a, a way that you could actually then uh, manage the, the hitch point of that particular smoothing frame if necessary by laser control, automatic control, and, and actually grade uh, grade your moulds according to a plane of laser light, for example, across the field. So th there are ways you can build in more levels of technology onto what is traditionally a pretty basic system. If, if, if we move to the other end of the extreme here and go to a, a simple three-point hitch um, version of the mould drainer, there you can see Clearly, we, we, we in theory haven't got a long beam here, but of course we can actually contrive and make use of the, the, the tractor linkage, the three-point linkage, and the point of, convergence, point of convergence of that linkage. In other words, the point where the imaginary line that you draw between your lower link uh, ball ends on the, on the implement and your, your lower link arm attachment on the tractor, where that line crosses the top link imaginary line that's where the what we call the virtual hitch point of that machine is. That is, in effect, the length of your beam, and, and that's where your long beam is pivoting from. So by judicious choice of where those hitch pins are placed, where those hitch heights are, are set, for example, the top link height there, I've put you a couple of different lines of top link. You can vary both the point of convergence forwards to make the beam longer, uh, if necessary, but also the height of, of that beam uh, virtual hitch point, which in effect then starts to control your actual mould mold draining depth. For this, of course, you need for that three point hitch to be in float. If we've got position control, the system just won't work. So we do need to be in full float with a, a mounted version of this, of this style of machine to then utilise that capability of the of the bullet itself to do that smoothing action that remove that um, inconsistency and produces that very even on grade mole. A few other little points to, to just to just to follow through with. Um, if you recall the critical depth, we need to be below that. Those of you that have done soil and water basis will be aware that uh, Mostly there's a ratio of about six to one in terms of the uh, the width or frontal uh, width or area of a, of a ground engaging part. If you multiply it, apply that by six, you will get its critical depth. So a, an inch wide time would probably have a, a six inch deep critical depth. Well, if we apply that ratio to, to mold draining, it still applies. We need to be below the critical depth. So we want to be a greater than six to one ratio of the expander diameter to the working depth. So in other words, if we've got an 80 mil expander on a, on a 70 or 75 mil bullet, something like some around about there, then that's going to be needing to be operated at more than nominally 480 mil deep to ensure it's working below its critical depth. If we don't achieve that, then we haven't got the capabilities of uh, achieving that, that very consistent mole. There's also another ratio to consider here, uh, and that's the one between the bullet and the expander. And normally, clearly, the expander has got to be larger than the bullet to close the leg slot and to create that degree of compression and, and plastic deformation to, to produce as that long-lived mole. And, and that ratio normally is, is, is between 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.3, 1.35 uh, times the the, the bullet should be your expander diameter. The smaller of those ratios, 10% greater, in other words, would be on a soil that's probably a little bit drier or prone to collapse. You don't want to be expanding it too much under those circumstances. Equally, if the soil is relatively wet or unconfined, and what I mean by that is we haven't got any weight on top of the beam scrubbing, for example, then it may well be that we actually want to increase that uh, expander ratio just ever so slightly. Uh, clearly when stuff wears, as the expander wears down or the, the bullet wears, then we have to be aware of that because that's going to affect those ratios and with that it's going to affect the efficiency of making that mould. The final one really to think about uh, when, when we're talking about wear on, 
on agricultural um, components. Thinking about that bullet, um, hopefully the explanation as to why it was as long as it is was, was clear earlier on. You can see as a direct result of that there, if, if you wanted to compensate for a worn bullet by pitching it nose down, for example, which I've seen happen, you, you can pitch it nose down and get a little bit more down suction to pull it in when it's when it's no longer really long enough. What you are doing there is risking pulling a instead of a of, of a of a circular channel with a bullet, you're probably going to be pulling an oval channel. And unfortunately, the, where it becomes oval at the top and bottom is exactly where you, you want that expanding action to take place to close that leg slot up. So it's possible here to, to, to make a really appropriate compromise and, and pitch that, that bullet down to suck the thing into the ground against probably the beam scrubbing the deck and think you're doing a good job, whereas in actual fact, you, you, you're creating far too much upward lift you actually risking going above your critical depth and not not doing the job we want there at depth. Final points here would be um, when you've pulled the mole in an ideal world, if we're up to quite plastic conditions at depth, we're maybe not too far away from field capacity at depth. Um, maybe hopefully a bit dry on the other surface. But if, if we then get a quite an intense rainfall event occur or one or two, uh, decent heavy storms pass by or there's forecast heavy rain for a, a number of days it doesn't give that mole channel long enough to cure long enough for the for there to be air in it for those fissures those little styrations you see in the middle top picture there those little styrations to actually dry up and, and cure a little bit because in the end of the day those those tiny little styrations are the things that allow pathways for the water to seep into that mole over a you know a, a reasonable length of time so we do need time for that mold cure uh, so if, if you've got forecast heavy rain and you you you, you zone near mole depth is nearly up to field capacity it's as well well advised to back off molding a, a few days before intense heavy rain otherwise it's likely that those mole channels will collapse quite quickly uh, and, and you'll get a, uh, the result of the bottom centre picture there in the mole very quickly. Um, a few other little minor minor points and attention to detail. Um, traditionally, if, if you've got a, a, a risk of pulling a lot of soil into your backfill, let's say that the, the soil is, is, is um, a, a quite reasonably uh, loose at the time and, and you, you, you've got a risk of pulling soil into that, that backfill or the backfill channels aren't that that wide then some people have, have attached a small little little leg little tie into the back of that expander just to just to just to grate through the backfill and, and clear a, again a pathway between the actual channel downwards through that backfill through to the main drain but uh, you don't honestly see those an awful lot these days, really. And the final point on this section really is to consider your drainage maps. Uh, the reason it's important is because if you've got a, if you've got your drainage maps, it should indicate on them the direction and frequency of moling and depth as well, in actual fact. And you can see in both of those examples there the uh, the dotted lines um, and it actually says on the right hand map mole 24 inches by nine foot apart um, what that designer of that scheme is telling you by putting that on the map is that he's designed the main drains in that in that field to need moles to be effective in other words he's set those main drains probably too wide apart if you weren't moling um, so he is actually relying on you moulding to complete his job uh, of, of, of creating a, an effective drainage system on that field. Um, so if, if mould draining directions are indicated, the left hand map there is quite, it shows a field that's got a lot of undulations in it, a lot of different uh, gradients on it. And so it's quite a complex um, series of directions of moulding in that field. Um, Key, a, a key requirement, obviously, in order to make those drains most effective. And a little word of warning here that um, I found uh, in, in one case to my cost on a, 
on a more organic topsoil, a, a peatier topsoil above a clay subsoil, a classic sort of fen situation where a reference to the drainage map told us what depth to mole at. Um, the drainage maps had been drawn up in the 70s and by the time this was being mole drained significantly many, many uh, decades after that, uh, we'd actually lost some of that topsoil depth and, and if we'd referred to the map and gone at that depth with the mole drainer, would have pulled the main drains out. So it, it's a it's a a bit of a lesson there. Whilst it's important to refer to the maps, it's also worth getting the spade out and digging down and making sure that we've still got the same depth of soil in that field. Otherwise you can do an awful lot of damage quite quickly. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a a rough idea as to um, uh, principles of mould draining. Um, now, I think we've probably got a few questions, maybe Theresa, have we, from uh, one or two of the, the guys that listen to it? Yeah, thank you so much, Philip. Um, it's absolutely brilliant and takes me back to my days of basis soil and water and, and doing it. And I think it's the practical side of, of how to set it up and how to get it right that's, that's really important and really valuable. Um, yeah, and be really useful. And it's great having the recording because you can go back and rewatch those little bits as, as much as you like. So yeah, thank you so much for doing it. So just a few questions that are kind of practically related as to how people might go about doing some of these things and the impact on farm. Um, the first question, what, what would be the optimum gradient on mole drains um, to avoid them wearing out? Um, you don't want them, yeah, getting the wear and is, is there a good gradient? Um, yeah, yep. it's a good question, Teresa. I think I think what the guy what what he's mean by wearing out probably is is either is either laying in water, not having enough gradient for there to be a a, a consistent flow, but a steady flow down there. So we we, we certainly um, we want to be at least one in two hundred in terms of that gradient, um, half a percent or thereabouts. Um, Optimally, one in 50 to one in 100 is 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 okay. I, I think the one to watch for is if you're any any flatter than than one in 200, then that can create problems of of standing water. Depends on where you are in the country, doesn't it? What your fields are and what your ditches are like, and yeah, what you can do. Um, along the similar lines, um, a bit different, horsepower, is there a rule of some for horsepower requirement that you look at or um, what you can go with? Yeah, it, it's always been um, traditionally a, a high horsepower operation as this, relatively high horsepower compared to most other operations on, on the farm. It, it is what it is really. Um, I, I think it's a very slow speed. The slower the speed, the better. Three, four miles an hour max uh, is, is ideal. Um, so although we've got high draft, we probably haven't got quite as much power requirement to pull that at great speed. Um, it, it, it's very tempting because it's a steady old operation to go too quick and then you, you do risk going above your critical depth and not forming that, that long lived mole. and, and you know, it would be a classic. You've you've rushed putting the moles in, and they'll rush. Not they won't be there for long, and that's the, that that can be a problem. So, um, on average, rules of thumb with 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 power. Um, typically, if you were 50 centimeters deep with a, you know, in old money, a three inch or 75 mil bullet, um, it's going to take you probably a good two two and a half tons to pull that. So, if you're looking at um, five to six percent or so wheel slip you're going to need a 150 horsepower tractor that's going to have to weigh between seven and eight tons preferably a little bit more um, we're not trying to you know we're, we're trying to we're trying to transmit tractive efficiency here by a, a little bit of weight rather than incur too much wheel slip really Brilliant. And I know we did have a discussion before about um, heave and if you see heave on the surface and the speed of what you're going. And I just want maybe to just recap on that as well, because I think it's an important if you if you saw that in the field, what would you do about it? And that's related it is to what you said, isn't it? 100 so. percent classic. Um, if you can see heave, it's telling you it's above its critical depth. You know, the, what we do, what we ideally want is for the soil to be displaced and expanded and the surface of the ground essentially not to be lifted. Uh, and it, it's possible to, to 
increase the likelihood of that under dare I say it less than ideal plastic conditions by scrubbing the beam on the deck because you've got the weight of the beam holding the holding the the, the soil down and and that is a um, an effective way of doing it you are then relying on that surface to maintain your your grade because the beam's scrubbing the deck um, I could quote your chapter and verse on how much power you can consume by scrubbing a beam on the deck it can be up to 50 percent of the draft can be can be um, consumed by just friction um, and the classic would be you know af after a, an hour or two of doing this if you put your hand on the beam and it's quite hot or quite warm and it can be it's showing you've got plenty of friction there well th there are losses there um, so yeah you, you, I've known situations where in order to get probably below critical depth operation to avoid that lift as you call it um, the farmer will, will stick the beam on the deck and scrub the beam on the deck and that it, it, it can be a way around it um, not ideal for me the if you can pull that mole with the beam clear of the ground it's telling you you're pulling a very good mole good um, so moving on, so mapping, um, and you just talked to the end about kind of drainage maps. If you're moulding um, with RTK guidance, can you try and pull in the same line next time you mould drain in the field, thinking it should be easier to pull the mould drainer? Or is that the best thing to do or um, in I, a different way? I would prefer, yeah, I'd prefer to go the other way, Treasure, if you could. Um, you. you I can see the logic. I accept the logic. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, if you've got RTK and you know where you've put your your previous five or six years ago drains, you know I've I've dug in fields and and the farm or so I haven't mulled this for ten years and it's still running. Um, so I, I'd I'd prefer to keep them going while you can. And it may not be the full length of the mole, the entire length of the field, but if you're between a, two backfill runs, that's you know that's good enough. Uh, so I, I'd prefer to, to map where you've been and then pull the next ones in the middle. You've got twice as many in potentially then, or, or you know, you, you've maximised your chance of, 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 of what we're really trying to do here. Um, I, I think for me that would be the, the better way. Um, if you've got a, a sort of a bit of a vulnerable half made channel, half collapsed channel, and you start to go too close to that, there is a risk that you know some parts will be plastically formed well and some parts will be not particularly well expanded because they're already in a bit of a weak area so i i, I think it would be i think i'd do i would do as much as i could to be some okay um so is it safer to go a bit shallower with old drains than risk bursting a mate or busting up a main drain um Absolutely, uh, and and discretion is the better part of valour. There, um, particularly as as I mentioned, if if you've got a, a if you've got a soil that's prone to 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 to, to losses through either oxidisation or or um, erosion or whatever, you know, fen peat is classic, where you know we all know that 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 soil is lost over a period of time. Um, yeah, it, it, reference to old maps might well put you straight into the into the main drain. So yeah, if if in doubt, um, err on the side of caution. As 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 that mole is being pulled through the as the beam's been pulled across the across the field. You, if if you health and safety would would tell me these days you shouldn't stand on it and ride on it clearly, but you should be able to hear that thing grating through. Um, the backfill as it as it passes every so often you hear it grating and the thing will shudder a little bit as it goes along um that's a good sign you know you've you've you, you're in exactly the right place yeah, what you want to do yeah good um different again where mole draining well no where no field drainage exists at the moment how valid is mole drainage kind of building on what you just said is it would it be valid or if there isn't anything there at the moment is it worth doing um because there are some cases where that is you know odd cases maybe old airfields or old kind of sites but yeah um what would you no, recommend no, I, I, mean, I, I accept you know it, it's not a perfect world and and 
a well pulled mole, a well formed mole, will we, we, we'll, we'll start to move your water, um, you know, away from the field. Uh, I, I think I think you, you you'd have to have a ditch to start from. Uh, we mm -hmm. must be starting from ideally a ditch or. We, we, we need a pathway to get that water, not to just a low spot, but off the field. Uh, if you can't find a ditch, then if you've got a main drain somewhere, it may be that you can, you've got one main at the end of the field, you can you can start pulling it from there. And, 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 and what we're really trying to do is just common sense and find, find a pathway that is preferably going downhill you know so we can we can get the water away um but yes uh it, the, there's another technique that was that was evolved by um my old tutor actually uh, dick godwin a, a number of years ago looking at um at a, a difficult situations where fields were flooded and and fields were waterlogged we couldn't go and loosen them because it was too wet and, and a pulling shallow moles at 30, 35 centimetres, 300, 350 mil deep without expander, just pulling a series of shallow moles can um, can create your channels to, to move water away from um, waterlogged areas, again, provided you're careful about making sure that the gradient is reasonable and, and that that can be an effective process as well, actually. Um, clearly, you can't do anything else, so it, it it can be a useful one. Multiple uses. Good. And the last question then, um, thinking about a no-till rotation, it's obviously a bit different with what we're doing in our soils. Um, when might be the best place to carry out moulding? You know, is it best to use a bit of tillage after you mould to level the surface to ensure you get the more even crop establishment? Or, yeah, if you're in a no-till situation, mould drainage. When would you do it? Yeah, and I, I think you could see it again if if the maps say that it needs moling, then it's a very valid um, operation. Um, I think I would always focus on um, we need to make the best possible mole we can. The best possible form mole won't have surface heave. So, in a way, if you if if you can hit the situation and conditions right, then um, we're not going to get too much in the way of needing to level it. I think would be the would would be the way to come from. If if you're if you're leaving a very uneven heaved surface, our alarm bell should be ringing and and let, let, let's move that to a different period when we're you know we we damper down below and drier on top. Um, if you're into a um, more of a direct drilling scenario, it's highly likely you'll be growing cover crops. Um, cover crops brilliant at drawing moisture so if you have a scenario where you're going to establish some cover crops and the situation is 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 quite damp when you establish them or whatever allow them to draw the moisture near the surface that will give you better conditions for traction hopefully it's still going to be a bit plastic at depth where we're going to do a good molding operation so it can be integrated quite well with 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 cover crops if we're putting a spring crop after, there might well be a window there. Just think about it. Do it once, do it properly. Is that the way to do it? <laughs> Watch this again and again and try and get it right. No, thank you so much, Philip. It's really invaluable information and, and good to go through. So um, we haven't got much time, but would you like to just do a quick chase through the, the soil loosening yeah. just to kind of link it in yeah. um, and then we'll oh, round right. that up. So. Yeah. yeah, we'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. So. Just as a lead on the, the final element really then of, of, of creating these pathways uh, for water is to, is to ensure we haven't got any barriers uh, near the surface. And um, in more recent times, and I think with the advent of better technologies that we're getting better pressure technologies, better trafficking, better guidance, better, better uh, ability to control where we drive, control where we traffic. In effect, what we're doing is actually reducing um, in our fields, the severity of, and possibly, and more than likely, the depth of problems. Um, and with this then comes the ability for, for roots to be able to solve a fair few of those problems, but where we've got conditions that roots just can't fix it, then in my view, I, I think 
we can contrive a situation where we maximize the efficiency of those roots growing we're going to get to a situation where our soil is in good structural condition as quickly and as efficiently as possible and and in effect what we're trying to do is is if we've got an identified compacted layer and i'm assuming in all of this if we're going to do this uh, this job it's because we've got a problem in the first place so I, I dig down and identify where that problem is it's highly likely to be shallower than you think it's highly likely not to be too deep uh, and in principle what we need to do is 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 apply to that layer a controlled stretch action um, that can be done with a, a range of tines the one i've shown there has got wings on it and a narrow tip uh, quite a few of them have it can be a it can be a low rake angled um, angled bent leg tine paraplow style tine um, but in effect what we're trying to do here is is take that problem lift it and stretch it without disrupting and without pulling from down below uh, that sort of the surface and, and encouraging a mixing operation we're, we're trying to retain the structure as near as we can to what it is and what nature would give us but at the same time produce uh, a controlled stretching action. So what we're after is enough height to lift and stretch uh, that, 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 that problem layer two. And the rule of thumb here is the deeper um, you operate, though the deeper that the problem is, the greater the lift height, uh, the, shallower, the, the, the shallower the problem, the nearer you come to the surface, so must that lift height reduce. Otherwise we risk disrupting the profile too much. And, and if, we, if we apply that lifting with a low rake angle, a shallow rake angle, again, we're, we're applying most of that force upwards rather than forwards. So again, we're minimizing the risk of, of disrupting that soil to produce a really a too loose, non-supportive structure. The structure I've in, indicated there in, in the graphic is a series of, of columns of support, really. Uh, just to the right-hand side is what that actually does in the real world you know you can see there a layer that's quite tight it's got quite low porosity and what we've done is lifted it pulled it apart stretched it and we've produced pathways for roots to go down and that's really where we're now going to start the process of improving that structure roots are going to get down in there we're going to get cycles of wet and dry the roots are going to start to extend into those columns and start to, to open them up and create more permanent pathways for water and further roots to grow in, in, in the future. Um, so if we're thinking about enhancing natural actions, think back two years really now, and the, uh, a dry harvest, dry autumn, a lot of our soils had big cracks in them, like you can see there in the picture on the left-hand side. Um, often nature had done the job. We'd, we'd, we'd produce cracks. If, if we pull metal through a, a field situation like that, it's highly likely we're not going to crack the soil up any more than those natural planes. That's where the weak planes are. Um, it's likely all we'll do is disrupt those those big blocks and pull them to the surface. Um, nature's done a pretty good job by working with that now. And, and the example here I'm showing is, is of a very shallow tillage operation just to just just to create a very shallow stale seedbed in this case or chip a few of those. Uh, surface clods into those cracks. Same action you could achieve by direct drilling this field, more or less. Uh, you, you, you'll achieve a very similar scenario to this. Uh, this contriving it with a very shallow tillage operation just starts to put a few clods into those cracks and they act as spaces to sort those cracks from completely closing back up again when that soil swells up. So we achieve a situation where we've now got we've created some planes of weakness and we've kept them there for future um, and the other thing we're doing with this is when that soil swells up those clods although they'll crush they're actually very 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 um, useful because they're, they're forming points point separators we're, we're actually creating little 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 wedges in the soil here when that soil swells up we're creating uh, point loads which are many hundreds of of, of tons in in force and they themselves can create more cracks in, in that profile as it's swelling up you don't actually see them because by definition the soil is swelling at the time but they they they're created and when that dries out again you will see on, upon 
uh, shrinking again, you, you, you'll end up with more cracks in its time. Um, so that, that could be quite positive. Um, picture on the, on the right hand bottom there, I'm showing you a um, heavy clay soil down in Essex that had no metal through it. That was the result of that dry autumn. And really, there isn't a lot of differences there between that profile and the one in the middle, which we've produced by mechanical means at a situation where we're moister. Uh, we're really trying to achieve the same thing here, except that we're just trying to help nature along a bit. And, and that is, in essence, where a, a more modern thinking, low surface disturbance type action, I, I think, starts to become very sustainable and work with nature to help roots to ultimately fix that problem. And you can see there as that as that field, the dry dry scenario, as that starts to swell up the, the second picture across there, little clods there, little spaces are stopping those cracks from completely closing. The exact reverse of that we had last autumn, clearly where we were, we, we were the opposite end of the moisture spectrum, very wet. Here, if we're actually using a, um, a, a cover crop as part of our uh, system our rotation maybe to go into a spring crop possibly for means of, of controlling black grass as part of a, of a, of a of an extended you know a rotation to 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 actually um to move that into very delayed or spring drilling um using that cover crop can be quite positive again we, we can actually use that cover crop to um Establish that early. Again, what we're trying to do here is, is, is utilize the power of the sun and the time and the soil temperatures that are there in an autumn. Get the cover crop established. Let it tell you what's happening. Let it tell you what's, what, what, what it's doing. Let it show you where it's struggling. And if there are areas in the field where we're not actually uh, achieving very good uh, cover crop performance, then potentially we could use a sward lifting type low disturbance action as I've just described and loosen through that growing growing crop uh, and, and create a, um, a situation where we've where we've in, encouraged those roots to actually get down and, and open that profile up and use the power of those cover crop roots now to do some structuring. You know, it's a crop that you're not actually going to get a yield from. So the logic here is to use those roots to, to, to the best possible effect and, and, and open that soil up. And, and if we can help it by um, a sward lifting type action as that crop's growing, then so be it. It might not be the whole of the field. It might be just certain areas within the field that we need to do that loosening operation to. It's possible that cover crop will tell us exactly where it is. The pictures here show you a, a part of a turning headland. It's part of a, a field that has had a a sugar beet uh, heap of uh, storage on it uh, a few years prior to that. Uh, cover crop wasn't growing very well, so we loosened through part. Or we loosened through that uh, part of the field. I left a little bit of that um, area unloosened, and this is the following spring barley crop that was established into that sprayed off cover. And you can see on the left hand side where we had loosened that cover, the barley roots have followed those cover crop roots down and have done a, a very effective job. On the right hand side was an area we left as a control where we didn't loosen and you can see the barley roots haven't grown there neither did the cover crop roots and the result was just over a ton of hectare benefit of, 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 of yield to that spring barley in the area where we'd loosen through the cover crop we didn't need to loosen it particularly deep in that case it was only at about 15 uh, 17 centimeters in depth so really that uh, that sort of wraps up where I was where I was thinking in terms of um, of really applying soil loosening principles to to where we're at now and where we might be in the future um, really acknowledging that at the end of the day it's the um, it's the root of the of the crop or the cover that's growing rather than the metal that's actually going to do the, the the job in the end Brilliant. Thank you so much, Philip. It just ties off the picture, doesn't it, as a whole, and the thinking about the two in together, um, particularly this year, kind of that we've had. Um, it's kind of thinking about this in summer 2020 with with the seasons that we've had. Um, so just a couple of, of questions on this one. Um, yeah. 
thinking about kind of subsoiling, how important is the machine that you're actually using or is it actually the depth, the moisture, the spacing more important than what's, you know, actually going through the ground, if you like? Um, it's a good question. I, I think if, if, if we take the definition of subsoiling, we're talking about a deep operation, then um, most important is, is, is to make sure you're, you're working above your critical depth here, that we're doing that lifting and loosening action. So we, we, we're going to be on quite high um, lift heights if we're working quite deep, preferably low rake angle, so we're not disrupting the soil too much. Um, you know, the, the, if we if we really start to disrupt that soil profile, it, it's akin to ploughing really, and and we're creating a situation that's very unstable. If you drive over that and traffic over it, there's there's no support left, so it'll it'll squash down, it'll it'll reconsolidate quite quickly, quite quite comprehensively really. Um, so instead of that, if, 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 if we try and produce those vertical columns by less disruptive action, that, that result is more sustainable without a doubt. If, if, you were, if you were thinking about nearer the surface as a low disturbance action, it's really all we're trying to do there is pull the soil apart. If, if we're in a field, I had a spade with me, or I, I just stick the spade in and lever that spade back at about 30 degrees from vertical, that action is enough, just that gentle lift. Um, we've got columns of support there. We've probably left most of the crop intact if there is root ball or crop on the surface. It's like sward lifting a field, really, Teresa, it's the same sort of thing. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I think I think the, 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 the choice of, of wearing part, the choice of point and wing is massively important. And, and it does depend on the depth you want to work, really, to do the job right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like all these things, it's it all ties in together to make it a good job, doesn't it? And talking about, you can just talk about low disturbance, talking about kind of low disturbance machines, um, as a question about your thoughts specifically on these, you know, versus to others, and are they a bit lacking compared to kind of larger wings? Would it leave the soil in a, a better or worse condition for the following cropping that's coming? Or what's your thoughts on those? I, I think they have without a doubt a place and, and, and I think going forward that might be quite important you know as, as I say as, as we as we reduce the intensity of soil damage and, and try and develop more robust and resilient soils then I, I think that type of action that lifting and stretching subtle action will become very much more important and probably that'll do for most people okay if you if you're in a if you're in a rotation where you're growing root crops or you you know you've got intense action you've probably got potentially harvest damage then it might be different um no i th i think the, the the blueprint to look for with that style of machine is is if you if you're thinking about it is really to, to relate it to sword lifting so if you're thinking about keeping hold of root ball keeping hold of of natural um, stabilizers then we need a disc in front to cut through that so we're not disrupting it too much we need a low disturbance leg, narrow, a low t a narrow tip, a, um, a, a low rake angle, adequate, but not to, not nowhere near, only just enough, let's say. Let's say. Um, and then we need a roller on the back that's the means of depth control that'll leave you, again, a consistent surface. So if, if again, you're sword lifting, the type of roller you see on a sword lifter is quite subtle. It could even be a rubber tie packet. You know, it's not like we're thinking about doing a, um, a sort of half a cultivation action here and breaking clods up or, or leaving a, a, a very sort of halfway to a seedbed type surface with a with a press type action. We, we probably just want to just push that sward, that that root ball in, in, in effect back down again. Brilliant. Thank you. And then moving on to a slightly different system, if we're talking strip tillage now and thinking about the Missouri Claydon type systems and um, where they've got that leading um, ripping leg already kind of in place, is that actually subsoiling too frequently if you're using this drill every year on the same ground? It's a, it's a tricky one of people moving between these systems. What's that effect going to have? Um, I, I think for me, um, 
crazy. I mean, I, I, you know, my history was was designing machines to rip saws to bits for loads of years, and I, you learn, don't you, as as you as you as you get older, that that probably the the pathway through this isn't isn't as aggressive as probably it was for a start. And and I think I think for me, any form of loosening action should only be done if it's needed. So if you've got a a strip till machine then if you need to loosen yep do it if you've done that regularly the, the the worst thing to do in farming is not to have a rotation of anything you know if you've got wall to wall one crop or you've got wall to wall the same tillage action and you're not rotating tillage depth or tillage action for example certainly tillage depth then you do risk creating a problem at whatever depth you're working at so um in that sense no matter what machine it is look to vary and and i would say with with hindsight and with experience if if i could default everyone i know i, I would default them to doing less than they would ideally think they should do i think you probably will get an equally good if not a better result and that's been a big change over the last few years, hasn't it, from where, where we've gone and where we're coming to and the change in thinking and the old adage that, you know, the best tool in the on the shed is the, the spade, you know, and, and a piece of machinery and going out and seeing what you've got first and then and then what you need to do as a result and what other options there are um, that you have available to you on farm or working with other neighbours and things. So last question um, for today then. So where there is a lot of legwear in one spot, does that indicate where the biggest area of compaction is as in a plough pan? So it's quite a straightforward question to finish maybe. <laughs> it's a good question actually. It's a very good question. It's absolutely spot on. Yeah, that's what a lot of us see as well, isn't it? So If you've got a dense area in your soil, then, then that is generally going to create more wear. Um, if, if you if you if you wanted to be absolutely attention to detail on this subject then you do also need to just be aware of is that at the front or the back of the leg and the reason i say that is because if, if that was at the front of the leg near where the front shin is then that's exactly right that's where it's cutting through that layer if that wear was at the back of the leg immediately above where a wing is for example it's actually a sign or potentially a sign that your wing hasn't lifted the soil up enough, hasn't produced fissures and has actually compacted it upwards below critical depth, made the soil more dense and worn the back of the leg away. Um, so I do see that quite a lot where uh, historically a farmer would probably want to be making a, a prepping a, a, an orsi drape seed bed while he's loosening and, and often they'll cut part of the wings off or they'll 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 re, they'll reduce the lifting effect to leave an absolutely spot on surface, and that then works for the initial establishment of the crop. But what they might have done is reduce the effectiveness of lift, and if that starts to wear away at the back of that leg, it's telling us that we've actually not stretched it enough. We've actually gone below our critical depth almost. It's a real. So if it's at the back of the leg one should be very conscious that you might just want to look at those wings. Good. Go out and have another look at it and, and see where, where it is. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, lots of really interesting insight there on the practical side, like we say, and, and the principles of it. And sometimes in the seasons that we've been faced with, it's hard to marry the two, isn't it? What machinery you have, what your saws are like, what the weather's kind of doing, but you know, if we kind of keep those ideas in the back of your head and then see what's practical in those seasons um, and do the best we can, then then we'll get there. Like you say, as as we always say, attention to detail in anything is is the way forward. Brilliant. If you'd just like to go on to the next slide, I've just got a couple more links, um, if that's OK. Thanks, Philip. Uh, so the information that Philip's talked about has kind of taken you into a hell of a lot of detail um, that, of what is available. We do also, as AHTB, have the field drainage guide um, that's available to download from the Knowledge Library section of the website. And that, Philip, you know, Philip was instrumental in putting that together. Um, and it goes into lots of the detail on, on these kind of things with the diagrams and, and things that Philip's talked you through as well. So it'd be well worth downloading that and having a look through. 
and um, we've also got two relatively new publications the arable soil management guide and then the principles of soil management both of which go into more detail but in a bit more of a holistic sense don't they philip of, of the wider information that's out there on soils on soil biology and how you might manage them and then how that might work in an arable situation all of that is on our Great Soils website and on there you can also find the links to the research that AHDB is doing, the Soil Biology Soil Health Partnership and the wider work that's going on on your behalf um, with your levy. On top of that, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there are a couple of the videos on our AHDB Cyrus and Oilseeds YouTube um, channel as well that you can have a look at. So. Um, have a look today. Hopefully what um, we've gone through has helped and then there are those other resources as well. Um, and if you can't find anything, do let me know and I'm sure we can put you in touch with Philip or Harry or um, someone of our farmers on the ground. So if you'd like to go to the last slide, Philip, it's just um, for Philip and I to say um, thank you very much for listening. Hope you found it useful. And for me to say a big thank you to Philip um, to give up your time to do this. Um, it's so practical and useful. And I know a lot of people will benefit from listening. So thank you so much, Philip. Um, thank you, everybody. And that's the end of the recording for today. <laughs>